So, just a few more of the uh, of the tachycardias left. <clears throat> 22-year-old man vomiting diarrhea for five days. Now he's lightheaded and hypotensive. So again, first question: regular or irregular? Regular, narrow, wide, narrow. So narrow, regular. Three possibilities: sinus tach, SVT, and flutter. Okay. So, and then the, the answer is going to be based on what's the atrium doing? So what do you notice? Turn it upside down. Turn it upside down. Do you see flutter anywhere? No, no, not really. If you look at standard needs four, that little peak on top of the T, that little P wave there. Not a peak. A poke. <laughs> Good. So this nice example. I know what you're saying. So there's a little deformed. This that's the little camel hump, and it's a little deformed, little pokey, right? Or peak. You notice that T wave. That's a buried P wave in there. So this is just sinus tachycardia. It's a 22 year old guy, so he can mount quite a sinus tachycardia. <clears throat> if this were a 70 year old, there's no way that they could mount a sinus tach at 170. All right. So good, sinus tach, ventricular rate's 170, and, and of course, treatment is just going to be based on the underlying condition, dehydration, okay? Sorry, just P wave after in which lead? In V1, it, there's, first of all, it, it's, it's very important to look for anything, and it looks like maybe there's a little something right after there, but then if that's a P wave, it needs to map out. Oh, wrong one. Okay. Um, all right. 75-year-old palpitations and chest pain. Regular or irregular. Irre narrow or wide. Narrow. All right. What do you think? What's the atrium doing? <coughs> I mean, anyone think that sinus tack, P, QRS, P, QRS? No. Flutter, and that leaves one possibility, SVT. And you'll notice, some people are, were mentioning this, there's a little P wave right after the QRS, and that's that retrograde P wave, which is very common with SVT. Okay? And if you want to specifically talk about it, usually this is an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, but no need to worry about that because it's going to be treated similar to the other ones. You can use an AV nodal blocker or adenosine. Vagal maneuvers is a very nice way of, of, of starting. All right? Would you call that bump in V1 P wave? Right there is the P wave. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Poker bump. Oh, what's that? Poker bump. A poker bump. Well, um, a po bump. How is that? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> 21, palpitations, lightheaded, systolic pressure, 75. Regular or irregular? Irregular, narrow or wide? Okay, so narrow, irregular, what are the three possibilities? AFib, MAT, A flutter with variable conduction. So first question, what's the atrium doing? Do you see flutter waves anywhere? No, not really. Now, this question had come up before. There's some blips up here, right? Right there and right there. Are those actual organized P waves like flutter? If you have any doubt, get your calipers and map it out, and they don't map out. There's no regularity to that. So that's probably just your classic coarse AFib, all right? Um, and the longer you stay in AFib, the smaller and smaller those, those uh, blips become. And heart rate's 152. The patient's a little bit unstable. So this is somebody that you might consider cardioverting, okay? And again, atrial fibrillation is probably the most difficult of all of the arrhythmias to cardiovert electrically. And so there's literature that's recommending that you start at 200 joules instead of 50 or 100. If, if you're going to electrically cardiovert an AFib patient, you're going to usually have to start relatively high. So, <clears throat> okay. 22, 57-year-old man, one hour after thrombolytics, and now the nurse gives you this EKG and says, what do you want to do? 
your hands in your pocket, step back, good. <clears throat> now, this is a real case. This patient was in our CCU. This rhythm developed. The patient had a stable blood pressure. This was diagnosed as VTAC. The patient got amiodarone and went into asystole and died. What's that? Right, but, but well, they, they called it ventricular tachycardia, so they used amiodarone. Um, why is this not VTAC? It's too slow, right? The rate here is only about 110, so, or 105. It's too slow for VTAC, and that's a classic mistake people make. If you just glance at this, it kind of looks like VTAC, doesn't it? But it's too slow, yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned that um, above 120, it's more, most likely VTAC, and below, most likely it's the ARVR. What happens when your rate is 120? Is there any way to differentiate between two? You know, it, it's actually relatively uncommon for VTAC to be at 120 or 130. Usually ventricular tachycardia is usually at least 140. So, so it's actually not that much of a gray zone. So it's very rare that you would ever encounter that circumstance. All right? Usually VTAC is at least 140. The rule says 120. But in clinical practice, it'll be very rare that you see VTAC less than 140 or so. Okay. Um, what else can give you things that look like VTAC but a slow rate? There's AIVR. Hyperkalemia can sometimes mimic VTAC. Tricyclic or sodium channel blocker overdoses can mimic VTAC. So just be careful. And again, if you treat those patients with antiarrhythmics, you may have bad outcomes as well. Okay? So be careful. And when in doubt, <clears throat> a little bicarb. It works for hyperkalemia. It works for your sodium channel blockers. Okay? Um, it won't hurt these patients. So if you have some doubts, just try a little bicarb. You may see that cure suddenly narrow, and you'll have your diagnosis. Okay. <clears throat> All right. 45-year-old alcoholic who's been having syncopal episodes. Yeah, question? Yeah. Sorry? This, this, what happened with this patient? So you said you should try some. Oh, bicarb, sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. Okay, so what's this? Torsad. Right, this is torsad. Um, so this is your, you know, you see the QRS complex is big, small, big, small, bigger, <coughs> small. Bless you. And um, you can appreciate a bit of a prolonged QT up here also. And I think. <clears throat> um, and again, after you defibrillate and get the patient back to sinus, what do you treat them with? Magnesium. Only magnesium is allowed, okay? No lidocaine, no amiodarone, no procainamide. What will those, those are all sodium channel blockers, and what will those do to the QT? It'll make it worse, all right? So and I think I've got some other ones here. So, what do you think? Psychiatric patient, you all have triage, where patients go into triage, and then, so... This pa you know, do you have to see psychiatric patients before? Don't you love that? Oh. <clears throat> so I try to say, you're cleared from across the room. And just keep, go, go see. <clears throat> but this one, I actually saw the chart, and the chart had some concerns. The triage nurse had written, patient, patient is somnolent, suicidal, um, being manipulative. Patient is faking syncope. So I thought, well, I better go see this patient. And the patient had just recently started some new antipsychotics. So I said, well, better get an EKG. So we got an EKG, and there's a prolonged QT in there. So I, but there's a lot of artifact also. So I was still trying to stall. So I said to the tech, can you please go back and get me another EKG with a better baseline? So he came back and said, Dr. Mathieu, I've got a better baseline for you. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said to him, what was the patient doing when you got this EKG? And he said, she was faking syncope. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, she was going in and out of torsade, and that was causing her syncope. And why was she having torsade in the long QT? It was her new antipsychotic. Okay, so there's a lot of medications that will prolong your QT. Here is a patient that had severe gastroenteritis and had such severe electrolyte abnormalities that she developed a prolonged QT, all right? And there's also some PVCs and a little ST depression, both of which are very characteristic of hypokalemia. 
hypokalemia is well known to produce a little ST depression and PVCs. <clears throat> so, and she actually had a cardiac arrest from her severe hypokalemia. I don't have a rhythm strip of that. But what I now do is any time I've got a patient that I'm really worried about severe electrolyte problems, you know, at University of Maryland, it might take an hour before we can get the electrolytes back on a good day. On a bad day, it might take two hours, and then you'll find out it never got sent. <laughs> um, so, so now, what I, if I'm really worried about their electrolytes, instead of just letting them lay in the hallway for hours, what I'll do is I'll just get a quick EKG and look at the QT. And if the QT is very long, they need to come back and be put on a monitor right away. If their QT is short, then I don't mind if they wait a little bit. So here's a nice case, 51-year-old woman with acute gastroenteritis. And she looked pretty dehydrated, so I said, let's get an EKG. And her QTC is 652. <clears throat> when do you start worrying? I worry about the QTC when it's over 500. Right? That's my magic number. All right? Because that means they're starting to be at risk for torsade. So her QT is very long. So we put her on a monitor instead of just letting her sit and wait for labs. And during the hour that we were waiting for the electrolytes to come back, she did this. So she went into torsade. Thankfully, she was on a monitor, so we shocked her immediately. She had a good outcome. Otherwise, she would have been laying in the hallway dead. Here's another one, 42-year-old man who's having alcohol withdrawal, and <clears throat> alcoholics are at high risk for prolonged QT because of electrolyte abnormalities, right? All alcoholics are hypomag, hypomagnesium, and oftentimes hypokalemic, okay? It's, in the U.S., it's federal law. <laughs> All alcoholics are hypomagnesemic, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> so these T-wave inversions are old, but what's new this particular evening is he's got a long QT. So we put him on a monitor, and this is what he started doing. All right? And then somebody sent me, I think I've got, yeah, um, so this was a case sent to me, 55-year-old man. Methadone, do you all have methadone for heroin? We have a lot of heroin users in Baltimore. They, there's a lot of methadone claims. Methadone is, is a well-reported cause of prolonged QT. Bless you. A lot of people don't know about that. So his wife brought him in, and she said he keeps falling asleep on me when I'm talking to him. All right? <clears throat> he was on methadone, so we checked a 12-lead EKG. His QTC is 551. And every time he falls asleep, it's because he's doing this. All right? Now, first of all, I don't recommend getting 12 leads on torsade. All right? You shouldn't, I mean, normally this is a rhythm strip diagnosis. Nobody should ever look at a rhythm strip and say, well, this kind of looks like torsade, but I think I want to confirm it in 11 more leads. All right? <laughs> so this is what my residents did. They got a 12 lead. And so they decide to treat him with amiodarone. All right? What does amiodarone do to your QT? It makes it bigger. So on amiodarone, QT is now 653. And he went back into intractable torsade. And um, they had to cardiovert him about seven or eight times. And then they stopped the amiodarone and finally got him out of it. <clears throat> Here's a nice little differential for a prolonged QT that's worth keeping in mind. Anytime you see a prolonged QT, <clears throat> it's actually the QTC we worry about, the corrected QT. And the number that I worry about is when the, when the QTC is over 500. Yeah? There's a lot of issue with this QT, prolonged QT. Do you take it off the machine? Do you check the heart rate? Should it be under 77 or more than 77? <clears throat> what, what, what's your thought? Yeah, about this is the one time that I use the machine because um, the machines are pretty good at, inter at interpreting intervals in most cases. So, um, so I usually just use that, uh, what the machine's and, interpretation and, and, and is. And <clears throat> Yeah, you know, Bizet's formula is, is the formal, it's the R to R over the square, the square root of R, whatever. Um, it's, that's the issue, you remember. Yeah, it's, it, if you have enough time to calculate Bizet's formula, you need a, a, a faster emergency department, I think. Um, I mean, nobody has time to calculate that. And in reality, to calculate the true QT, what you're supposed to do is use Bizet's formula in three consecutive QRS complexes in three adjacent leads. So that's nine equations that you all average together. Just let the machine do it, all right? It's not worth that time. Um, so, so I just use what the, the machine's interpretation. If, it, if the, the machine looks way off, then of course you look more carefully, all right? The other, let me see if I have this. 
the other thing, if, you, if your machine doesn't calculate it for you, there's a simple way of just looking at it. What you do, <clears throat> you look at the R to R interval, and then the T wave should end halfway between or earlier. If the T wave ends beyond the halfway point, that's prolonged. All right? So if you look up here, the T wave, the halfway point's right about there. The T wave ends a little bit further along. Looking up here, there's an R to R interval. The T wave ends right about, or, or the halfway point's right about there. And the T wave is actually ending way over here. So that's just a simple way of looking at it and saying this is definitely too long. All right? So whenever you see a prolonged QT, Think about hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. Take a look at their electrolytes and take a good close look at their medication list. All right. <coughs> There's a few other things also. Acute ischemia prolongs your QT a little bit. Congenital hypothermia prolongs all of your intervals. Hopefully nobody here is diagnosing hypothermia on EKG. All right. Use a thermometer. <laughs> okay. Elevated intracranial pressure. Now, let me ask you this question. This is a tougher one, but if you, this is a nice little pearl to keep in mind, which will really make you look like a, um, uh, an EKG whiz. Here's a patient that came in um, with this 12-lead EKG. These T-wave inversions are old, but she's got a new prolonged QT. And every five, 10 minutes or so, she'd go into torsade. And we get her out of it. <clears throat> and we gave her some empiric magnesium, and it's not working. Anyone know what drug she needs? Potassium. What's that? Potassium. I didn't hear that. Potassium. But potassium. No, it's not potassium. <coughs> okay. You've got to fix the calcium. Why calcium? First. Oh, if it's, if it's hypokalemia? All right. Let me show you something about this EKG. All right. Here's your differential I just showed you, okay? Um, now, most of the time when people have a prolonged QT, for example, in this case, the reason patients develop a prolonged QT, and just as a reminder, the QT is measured from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T. Most of the time when people have a prolonged QT, it's because the T wave got stretched. And that's why they have a prolonged QT. In this case, the T wave is normal size. It looks like a pretty normal T wave, right? In this case, the prolonged QT is purely because the ST got stretched. All right? There's only two conditions that prolong the QT by specifically stretching the ST segment in that differential I gave you. Hypothermia and hypocalcemia. So if you ever look at an EKG and there's a prolonged QT and you look carefully and you notice, boy, that's a really long ST. The T wave looks normal. Give them some calcium, all right? And you'll look like a star. <coughs> all right, yeah. I only said the, the clue that you gave was that the magnesium didn't work. And one of the issues was as soon as you do <coughs> magnesium, you expect it to do something. You then should think of calcium. Right. Calcium first, the magnesium Right, that's a reasonable approach also. All right. Here's a few other hypocalcemic patients. And normal is about nine. Okay. So this is pretty low. And you'll notice the T wave looks pretty normal in size. It's just a really long ST. Another example, T wave looks T wave looks pretty normal. It's just a long ST. Okay? Another example. T wave, relatively normal, just a really long ST segment. Look at how long that ST segment is. And the T wave is pretty normal. So anytime it's really just the ST that's long, only two possibilities, hypothermia, we'll rule that out with the thermometer, hypocalcemia. All right? Give them a little calcium, you'll see the ST shorten up, and you'll get, you'll get them out of danger much, much faster than waiting a couple of hours for your labs to come back. All right. I think, is this the last one? 24? All right. <clears throat> 26-year-old, this was a nurse I was working with one day. He's a healthy guy, fairly slim, no medical problems, plays basketball regularly, you know. And he was having some palpitations. He thought it was just reflux. So he was taking antacids, nothing's working. And so we got this 12-lead on him. And he was going in and out of this. So is it regular or irregular? Ir 
and it's irregularly irregular, right? Okay, so we're dealing with a fib. It's wide, okay? And so a fib with the bundle or a fib with other possibility for wide? WPW. Remember how we said you tell the difference? A fib with the bundle would what? Right, right. Usually the morphologies are going to be same all the way across. What do you notice about this? The morphologies are changing. Some of the QRSs are really narrow, some of them are really wide, and some of them are everywhere in between. That's your clue that it's AFib with WPW. All right? And this patient cannot be treated like normal AFib with AV nodal blockers because you'll kill them. The one drug which is safe is procainamide. All right? You may have access to flecainide, and, and I think that may be safe also. <clears throat> Amiodarone is not safe. It's listed in many of the guidelines, but uh, the literature says it's actually not safe. The other thing you can do is shock the patient, which is perfectly fine as well. I offered to shock him. He said no. <laughs> but, um, so we gave him procainamide and then admitted him. He went to electrophysiology and, and had his accessory pathway ablated. Now he's doing fine. He never knew he had WPW. All right. So let's talk briefly about why this is so important. Now, WPW, this is not that uncommon in the emergency department. All right, amongst arrhythmia patients. The classic triad, as you may recall, is a short PR. Remember the other thing that gives you a short PR? Junctional rhythm. All right. The delta wave, slurred up stroke, slightly widened QRS. Essentially, you lose the PR interval. What, what, and, and here's your classic WPW. Notice the short PR and the delta wave. Um, so what exactly is happening with WPW? <clears throat> with normal conduction... The sinus node sends an impulse down to the AV node, and I like to think of the AV node as having two purposes. Number one, it slows down conduction. And number two, if it sees too many beats, it just kills the extras. Okay? Now think about it for a second. When a patient has atrial fibrillation, how fast is the atrium beating? Three, four, five, six hundred beats per minute. How fast is the ventricle beating in most rapid AFib patients? 150, 180, right? Have you ever wondered what happened to the other 350 beats? The AV node killed them. The AV node says, I'm only going to send 150 down. I'm only going to send 180 down. And it just squashes all the rest of them. That's why patients with atrial fibrillation don't show up with the ventricular rate of 600 or 500, because they, they'd be dead, all right? So that's the two purposes of the AV node. So the first thing, sinus node sends an impulse down, it innervates the atrium, that's where the P wave comes from. When the beat's passing through the AV node, nothing's happening, and that's your PR interval. <clears throat> then you get very rapid conduction through the Hisperkinji system, rapid contraction, and you get a narrow QRS because it's going through a very rapid conduction system, all right? When you have an accessory pathway, you've got your normal conduction coming down, but you've also got this accessory pathway, which has no AV node, nothing to slow it down. And as a result, the beat coming down this way hits the ventricle early, thus the term pre-excitation. And that ends up abolishing the PR interval. That's why there's no PR, it's, or it's slurred upstroke. So that's why the PR is very short or non-existent. There's no PR with WPW. And then you get rapid innervation of the ventricle through myocyte to myocyte, and also um, this, this beat eventually catches up and rapidly innervates the ventricle, but notice there's no PR, or practically no PR, and a slightly widened QRS, okay? Now, <clears throat> when patients develop atrial fibrillation with WPW, remember we've got four, five, six hundred beats per minute some of them are coming down the normal pathway, producing narrow QRSs. A lot of them are trying to come down the normal pathway and getting squashed or killed. A lot of them are coming down the accessory pathway, which is all too happy to conduct everything it sees. The result is, these are narrow beats, these are wide beats, and some of them are fusions between the two. That's why the morphology changes. Some are narrow, some are wide, some are fusion beats. And that's why the QRS morphology varies so much. 
So let me show you some examples of what AFib with WPW will look like. So here's your AFib with WPW. Irregularly irregular, morphology is <laughs> changing. Some are narrow, some are wide. Notice in some places you're approaching 300 beats per minute, right? Normal AFib never goes that fast. But when you've got WPW, that accessory pathway is happy to conduct really, really fast. So in some places, you're going to have rates approaching 300. Here's enough, and now for comparison, here's AFib with the right bundle. Nowhere are we approaching 300, and the morphologies pretty much stay the same. Here's AFib with WPW once again. In some places, we're approaching 300, and the morphologies are changing. Here's AFib with the left bundle. Notice, nowhere do we approach 300, and, in some, and, and the morphology stays the same. Okay, so with these patients, give them calcium channel blocker, beta block, whatever you want, not a problem. But when you've got AFib with WPW, notice it's irregular, so it's AFib, morphologies are changing, and in some places approaching 300 beats per minute. Okay, now if you just glance quickly at this, it kind of looks like VTAC, doesn't it? But if you look carefully, it's irregular, so it can't be VTAC. VTAC's not allowed to be irregular. All right, so it can't be. <clears throat> Here's another example. If you glance at this haphazardly, it kind of looks like VTAC, right? But look carefully. It's irregular, so it can't be VTAC. And the morphologies are changing. VTAC doesn't give you changing morphologies. This is AFib with WPW. Here's another one. Very rapid in some places, irregularly irregular. If you map it out with calipers, it's irregular. Morphologies are changing. AFib with WPW. Sometimes people look at this and say, well, how do you know it's not polymorphic VTAC? Well, polymorphic VTAC, the axis changes. And the axis is unchanging. Okay. Either way, I mean, if they stay in this, you're going to end up having to shock them. So it's not a big deal. But All right. Now, here's why it's be it becomes a big deal. This is a young patient who showed up with a tachydysrhythmia. No prior medical problems. The emergency physician glanced at the EKG and said, young patient, no prior medical problems. Well, you know, wide complex. Let's try some lidocaine first. What the heck? Lidocaine doesn't do anything to this. It doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. All right? Notice this irregular morphology is changing. Everybody here knows this is AFib with WPW. The physician didn't. Right? So lidocaine was given, nothing happened. And then the next drug he chose to give was adenosine. He said, with a young person, you know, maybe it's some kind of wacky SVT or what. Let's try some adenosine. How long does it take for adenosine to kick in? Ten seconds. Right? Ten seconds later, here's the rhythm strip. Right into V-fib. So what exactly is happening? Remember, with AFib and WPW, remember what our AV node was doing? It was squashing a whole bunch of the beats, right? It was doing a good job. Now what you did was you gave the patient a potent AV nodal blocker. You took this pathway out. Where do those 600 beats decide to go? Right down the accessory pathway, which is all too happy to conduct. So instead of a rate of 250 or 300, you suddenly have a rate of 600, and that's called ventricular fibrillation. All right. Here's another very similar example. The physician looked at this and said, oh, it kind of looks like uh, VTAC. Tried some lidocaine. It didn't help. didn't hurt. Is this VTAC? No, it can't be because it's irregular. Look carefully. It's irregular. And the morphologies are changing. So the second drug he chose to give this young person, he said, let's try some adenosine. Same story. <clears throat> Ten seconds into it, right into VFIP. Okay. Unfortunately, he just switched over to unsynchronized cardioversion and shocked him out of it, but very nearly killed a patient. All right? So be very, very careful about AFib with WPW. Irregularly irregular, morphologies vary, and any AV nodal blockers are well published to kill these patients. All right? What are your AV nodal blockers? Adenosine, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, DIG, digoxin. Interestingly, the case reports talking about digoxin indicate these patients die a couple of hours later when the ditch kicks in, all right? What about amiodarone? Now, here's the American uh, AHA guidelines. DC cardioversion, perfect choice. And they list amiodarone, flecainide, procainamide, propofenone, sodalol, all right? And they appropriately say all of these are harmful, any AV nodal blockers, all right? Well, 
Where I work in the U.S., we've got procainamide, which is perfect. In fact, procainamide preferentially suppresses accessory pathways, so it's perfect, all right? We don't have propofenone. If, if you do, then that might be a choice. We don't have flecainide. Amiodarone, everybody loves amiodarone, all right? Well, even though AHA put amiodarone up here as an option, it turns out if you look at the world's literature on rapid AFib patients with WPW who got IV amiodarone, the only, this is just a handful, but the only publications ever produced indicate deterioration. There's not a single case report, case series, or research study that has ever demonstrated I gave IV amiodarone to a patient with rapid AFib and WPW, and they did better. Not a single publication. And it turns out, if you look at the pharmacology of the amiodarone, am amiodarone is actually a class 1, 2, 3, and 4 antiarrhythmic. Remember what class 2 is? It's a beta blocker. Class 4, calcium channel blocker. So amiodarone is actually half AV nodal blocker. Here's an example. This is in our emergency department where the cardiologist had this patient with rapid AFib and WPW, and they gave the patient amiodarone, and the patient went right into VFib. Okay, now they didn't go out and publish this. <laughs> um, most people don't want to publish bad outcomes, um, but what I would just suggest is get rid of amiodarone. It is an AV nodal blocker, and it belongs down here with the other AV nodal blockers. The only, the, the best options, the most well-published options are either some sedation and cardioversion, which works perfectly, or, um, or procainamide, right? But stay away from all AV nodal blockers, right? Questions about that? Yeah. Um, is there an increased correlation between AA and uh, an accessory bundle, or is that just when we find out the person had an accessory bundle? Because yeah. we're always seeing it in, in an atrial fibrillation with all Parkinson's and Wife effect. Um, yeah. And patients with WPW have a propensity to develop supraventricular arrhythmias, either SVT or AFib. SVT is not a problem. It's the AFib patients that are a problem. So they're at, they're at a slightly increased risk of developing AFib compared to a non-WPW patient. All right? But this is the one you've got to watch out for. Okay. Okay, so just to quickly summarize... The bradycardia is an AV blocks. Again, ask what the PR is doing for your bradydysrhythmias. And then with the, um, with the tachycardias, ask those simple questions, narrow or wide, regular or irregular, and then what's the atrium doing? And, and you'll nail 95% of your arrhythmias just with these three simple questions. All right? Okay. So we're going to get... Time is flying. <laughs> All right, we're gonna um, we're gonna go on to the ischemia.